March 11th, 1983. This is Joe Todd interviewing Dr. George Lynn Cross. Dr. Cross, where were you born? Woonsocket, South Dakota. 1905. And when's your birthday? What month? May the 12th. May. Hi, how are you, sir? Hi. You said. Who is your father? My father was George Washington Cross. Was he from South Dakota? No, he was born in Zanesville, Ohio. And his father brought him uh, with a rather large family of boys, there were six of them, I believe, down the Ohio River to the Mississippi. Then they went up the Mississippi to Keokuk, Iowa, and there uh, my grandfather uh, bought a couple of teams of oxen and moved his belongings over to a piece of land which he homesteaded near Marshalltown, Iowa. I say near is about 10 miles. What year was that? Uh, 1855, uh, they made the trip. Uh, my father was five years old then. And who was your mother? My mother was Jemima, that's J-E-M-I-M-A, Jane, Dawson, D-A-W-S-O-N, who uh, was born uh, in Iowa, and of course met my father there, and they moved uh, to South Dakota when they were married, that's where I was born. They, uh, the price of land in Iowa by the time my father was old enough to do farming was uh, too high for him to be able to buy land. So came up to Dakota where it was cheaper land. Mm -hmm. What kind of work did your father do? Farmer. Farmer. I was born on a farm. Uh, did he homestead in South Dakota? No, he, it wasn't exactly a homesteading deal, but he bought uh, a quarter section of land from someone who had uh, homesteaded there. Mm -hmm. um, were any of your grandfathers in the Civil War? In the Civil War? No. Uh, my grandfather was... Uh, not, I believe, involved with the Civil War at all. He was a, uh, a farmer there in, uh, well, he, sorry, he was farming in Ohio when he migrated to uh, mm -hmm. Iowa. How large was the farm in South Dakota? A long what? How large was the farm in South Dakota you were born on? Quarter section. 168. Yeah. What kind of house did your father build? We had one. I didn't get that. Uh, what kind of house did your father build? The house that you were born in? It was a, uh, I have only a vague remembrance of it. Uh, we lived there only a couple, I think when I was three, we moved to another farm six miles north of Woonsocket, and I don't recall much about or anything about the perfect place. Mm -hmm. As a child, what kind of chores did you have to do? Oh, I milked cows, brought in wood, and uh, I helped my mother with a good bit of dishwashing. All kinds of the type of the typical work that a youngster would do. 
However, uh, when I was about eight, my father retired from farming, and my parents were elderly, and my mother was uh, 45 when I was born. My father was 57. Do you mind uh, leaving that closed? When you moved in the second farm, how far did you move? How far were the two farms apart? About six miles. Six miles. When did you start the school? Started the school <coughs> uh, in Woonsocket. Uh, I went to a Catholic school for a two or three year period when I was from about four until I was, oh, perhaps seven or eight. My father uh, lived in, uh, he had moved to town, thought he had retired from farming. Then uh, we moved to a third farm for a while. And I was a boarding student at the Catholic school. I was not a Catholic, but that was a convenient place for me to be. What was the name of the school? Um, I have forgotten the name of the school. It was a school operated by uh, a, uh, a Catholic church there, the uh, priest was at the head of the school, but I've forgotten the name of it, uh, the story. Okay. After you left the Catholic school, where did you go? What's I went, went to? Uh, in the beginning of my fourth grade, I went to the uh, public school there in Minnesota. Did you graduate from high school there at Woonsocket? No, I graduated from high school in 1923. How large was the school, the high school? Our graduating class was, uh, as I recall, 18. It was a very small school. We, uh, I suppose the total school would not have been more than a 100, 125. Do you have any recollections of World War One? Oh yes, very definitely. Yeah. Was there any uh, work for the war effort in South Dakota? Yes, it was a great war effort, a great excitement about the war. And of course, uh, I had a half-brother, my mother's son by a previous marriage, who was in the war in France. He was also involved, incidentally, with the uh, disturbance we had with Mexico during the days of Pancho Villa. Um, I remember well that uh, the shortage of labor during the war, uh, my father and I were picking corn for uh, a relative the day the armistice was signed. Uh, we were out about five miles from town and we could hear explosions in town and we had a kind of a feeling what it was all about. So we drove back to the barn and um, hitched the horses, went to town. We were going up and down Main Street firing revolvers and shotguns and that sort of thing. Big excitement. What was your half brother's name? Frank Washburn. Did you go straight to college from high school or did you work? <clears throat> yes, uh, I did, but I haven't uh, planned to. Uh, in those days, by taking certain courses in high school, you could qualify for a teacher's certificate, which would enable you to teach uh, in the public schools. Uh, I had a job uh, in a, uh, what was called a consolidated school at uh, Forestburg, South Dakota, about 10 miles from Woonsocket. <clears throat> I was to uh, 
teach uh, seventh and eighth grade mathematics and coach basketball. And one day, uh, the football coach from South Dakota State College came to town and talked with me about going to college. And uh, I explained I had this teaching job and uh, couldn't afford to go to college. And uh, he suggested that it might be a good thing for me to try to go to college uh, if I would come up to State College, if I would, could have a job washing dishes in the women's uh, dining hall for uh, my uh, board and they could find a room. There was no tuition and that sort of thing. And I would have a job on a construction crew during the summer where I'd get some little extra money. So there was uh, much discussion of this. My uh, father thought that I should continue with the teaching job, a pretty good salary, I think it was $1,300 a year. And, but my mother thought I probably should go to college. So I uh, had a visit with the school board. I'd already signed the contract. The uh, chairman of the school board was uh, very, uh, kindly person said if I had a chance to go to college I should do it so they released me from the contract and uh, so in September of 1923 I enrolled at South Dakota State College. Where's that located? Brookings, South Dakota. What were you teaching at the consolidated school? What was I teaching yes, where? Yeah at the uh, consolidated school. Well I never did start you see. You never started? Okay. Uh, never did start. Uh, all of this uh, went on during the summer of 1923. I signed the contract that spring, early, and the football coach came through a couple of weeks, as a matter of fact, after I signed the contract. And uh, I would have taught, I, my job was to teach mathematics to what we would call junior high. So you entered college the fall of 23? I went to, I went to college that fall, yes. Played some football and washed a lot of dishes. And uh, but I graduated in three years. And uh, bachelor's degree in 26 from South Dakota State College. And uh, <clears throat> master's degree in 27. And then I... Uh, got an assistantship at the University of Chicago, got my doctorate there in 1929. At South Dakota Teachers College, you live in a dorm on campus? I lived in a room that the coach found just off the campus. And did you get your MA from the same school? Got my MA from South Dakota State College, okay. same school, PhD from Chicago. Yeah. What was your master's thesis? What was the subject? My master's thesis was uh, on the internal structure of the corn plant. So you were majoring in agriculture? Anatomy, it was really uh, plant anatomy. It took you two years for your PhD at Chicago? <coughs> two years. Two years. Uh, at Chicago, you could uh, do it as much. Uh, actually, the story is a little more involved than, uh, than that. It might be well to, uh, for me to amplify a bit at this point. Beginning of my sophomore year, which was 1924, I, uh, the first day of school, I was over having my breakfast in the women's dining hall uh, early so I would be through and in a position to get the dirty dishes and put them in the dishwasher. <coughs> I sat there reflecting on the fact that I would have the first look at the freshman girls. And, uh, they would be coming through the line, and uh, soon about 60 of them did come down the line. And I uh, was looking at them with great interest. Uh, 
had bacon and eggs in my place. And, uh, one, a, uh, to me, a dazzling brunette uh, attracted my attention. I wondered how I could get to meet this girl. And as she went by, reaching for something, I noticed that uh, she had failed to uh, fasten a couple of hooks under her left arm. Her blouse was open, and I could see a pink undergarment, which gave me an excuse to go over and tell her something to the effect that she might know this was, uh, had happened, that she had missed those hooks, but I wanted to be sure. And uh, she uh, flashed an appreciative smile, but I didn't get to talk much with her. But uh, she just turned up in my zoology class the following Monday. I did get acquainted there. And we were uh, married in 1926. Uh, Let's see. In the fall, following my bachelor's degree, I had an assistantship there to work for my master's degree. And uh, her mother sent her to the University of Minnesota to break up the romance. So uh, I uh, was a little concerned about that. And uh, but my Mother had given me a Model T coupe uh, for graduation. Where she got the money, I'll never know. But uh, I drove over in October uh, 1926 to the University of Minnesota. And we were married the next day. And uh, she came back. And, enrolled at the University uh, at South Dakota State College where I was working for my master's degree. I got my master's degree the spring of 27 and uh, we were worried because she had just finished her junior year. She was a year behind me. She said I graduated in three years so we would have put her two years behind me and uh, one of the objections, uh, that her, one of the things that had worried her mother was that she would not finish college if she graduated. So I stayed on at South Dakota State College and taught bacteriology for a year while she finished. And uh, while I taught bacteriology, I uh, worked on my doctoral thesis. I'd been, I'd been to Chicago and Gotten, uh, a, gotten a uh, problem to work on and studied German and French uh, during that year. So uh, that was 1927 28. And in the summer of 1928, I went to Chicago for the summer session. She followed and got a job in the football tickets office. And, uh, she paid for the board room, and I had enough to pay for my expenses, uh, tuition, that sort of thing. So actually, uh, I had, uh, well, I got my PhD in the fall of 1929, conferred by Robert Maynard Hutchins, a boy president, uh, 30 years old at his first commencement ceremony. And uh, so I had really, if you will count up, there were uh, from 1923 until 1929, <clears throat> subtract the years I taught bacteriology, I was only involved a little over five years between high school and the PhD which was a mistake because I did everything too fast. But uh, I wanted to get through and get a job because uh, really to <clears throat> prove that the marriage was not a mistake to get what I mean, it was an interesting deal. So I got the PhD and uh, 
went to the University of South Dakota and taught for four years. And, uh, during those four years, which is uh, 30 to, uh, well, um, 30 to 34, you will recall the Dust Bowl, you've heard about the Dust Bowl days, and it didn't rain up there appreciably all the time we lived there. And uh, it was strictly an agricultural economy, and my salary was cut uh, 33 and a third percent. First three years I was there, and uh, I was uh, anxious to get away when an offer came from the University of Oklahoma. I accepted it with a great deal of uh, enthusiasm because it was a multi-economy here. They had oil and minerals as well as agriculture. I thought this would be a better place in the long run, even though I knew the rains would finally come to South Dakota. What year did you get the offer from OU? Did I get the uh, the offer from the offer here? I came the summer of 1934. Paul Sears, the head of the department, had lost a plant anatomist to the University of California at Berkeley and was looking for a replacement. He offered me the job. What was your dissertation topic? My dissertation uh, topic for the uh, doctor was the, uh, it involved uh, happenings <clears throat> at the stem tip of a fern, how leaves get started, and the reproductive uh, processes of the fern. And then I need, uh, what is your wife's name? Her name was uh, Cleo Sikink, S-I-K-K-I-N-K. So you began teaching at OU in 1934? Right. September. <coughs> So you survived the depression with not too much hardship. Always had a job, I had enough to eat, yes. Uh, didn't have much money though. It, uh, the, uh, the unemployed totaled about 30% uh, of the population in those days that really had uh, mm -hmm. problems and uh, I was interested one day in looking over my record of a trip and my expenditures for 10 cents for breakfast, and 25 or 30 cents for lunch, and splurge for dinner for about 60 to 75 cents. So uh, I, we didn't have much money, it went to the... Were there any... Uh WPA projects or oh, CCC yes, out, projects? Yes, out of the university. If you uh, are you familiar with the campus, you know where the duck pond is. Yes, sir. I went to school here at OU. And, uh, all of that uh, uh, stone uh, fence was the W around that uh, area east of the university was the WPA project. And uh, Jefferson House, which is now occupied by athletes, was uh, started as a project of that kind, but the war came and about in the middle of the project, we had to get money from the state to finish it. Mm -hmm. Were there any WPA projects in South Dakota? I am not aware of any, but I got out of there before uh, the WPA projects came a bit later after uh, Roosevelt was. They weren't in existence at the time I was up there. 
Where were you on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th? I, uh, I had taken my two, two children to a movie to see uh, some movie of interest to children and uh, came home in the afternoon and uh, Mrs. Cross told me that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor that afternoon, so I was in a movie. What was the reaction in Norman of the bombing? Well, there was an immediate uh, meeting of uh, students, faculty over in the field house to listen to a radio address by the president. And, uh, and immediately they were set up in the armory, uh, recruiting desks, and uh, <clears throat> an immediate exodus for en enlistees. We were skimmed of practically all of our physically fit uh, males uh, almost immediately. Were there any organized war effort groups on campus during the war? I don't recall any organizations on the campus uh, of that nature. Uh, there probably were, but uh, it's been quite a while. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. Yeah. A lot of war work was done, both of course, was a lot of USO activity when the Navy moved in, that sort of thing. Did you personally do any work for the war effort, you and your wife? Uh, my wife was very active in the USO, and, uh, but uh, I was a little bit too old. I registered for the draft. I was a little bit too old for the draft and not quite experienced enough to have a, uh, a type of job in the war effort that uh, many others had. We, the university supplied the personnel for a variety of war projects. Dean of our graduate school became head of a war manpower agency in Washington and that sort of thing. Was this the time when they built the Navy base here? Yes, the Navy base came very soon. Uh, well, the, uh, the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor uh, in uh, December of uh, 41, the base was under construction pretty early in 42, the North Base, followed by the South Base. Was there much interaction between the University and the Navy Base? Oh, yes. The, uh, and the uh, University had a great many specialized training programs for the Navy and the Army. And uh, there was a quite a mixing of uh, base personnel. They were seen on the campus a good bit. And uh, uh, we didn't have any really what you would call cooperative projects with the two bases. But uh, the university was just a war campus, really. Mm -hmm. See people in uniform, all males that you saw, young males would be in uniform on the campus. Such a few freshmen, too young to be drafted. How long did you teach it? I taught, uh, let's see, I taught or five, uh, seven years, and I became acting dean of the graduate college. When my, when, uh, as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, the uh, dean of the graduate college was called to Washington, the head of the war manpower, especially the scientific manpower agency there. And uh, but I was acting dean of the graduate college in 1942 and three, and became acting president of the university in 44, named in, actually named in December of 43. Who did you replace? Who had been president after that time? Joe Brandt 
was the sixth president of the university. He had come in 1941, and he left, resigned in 42. When were you named as president of the university? About the middle of the year, it was uh, July 44. Regents were hunting for a, uh, a president, but uh, failed to find anybody that satisfied them, and they asked me to take it over. And I served until uh, June 30th, 1968. Can you describe some of the more important I guess aspects of your term as president of, I don't know, I had a phrase question. The important things that happened? Yeah, or, right. Well, I suppose the most significant uh, thing, uh, most significant problem with which I was immediately confronted was the segregation problem. The southern states at that time uh, had uh, segregation laws which prohibited the mixing of uh, races, that is, the black and white races, in uh, universities and colleges. And Oklahoma had a law which uh, made it a misdemeanor for a university president to admit a, a black, called them Negroes, then to uh, a white institution. Fine was up to five hundred dollars in each day, a separate offense. And uh, we were selected, the University of Oklahoma, by Third Red Marshall, now on the Supreme Court of the United States, then a young attorney for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, he attended a meeting over at McAllister in nineteen forty-five, and. Uh, announced, oh, you had been selected as the institution in which the segregation laws of the southern states would be tested for the next four years we were in court. And uh, the Supreme Court decision in uh, OU was the test case. We are always the landmark cases. There were several of our first state of law, Cynthia Fisher, as a test case, the graduate of Langston, who loved to study the law. Later, George McLaurin, of the faculty of Langston, came to work for a doctorate in education. Our cases were the landmark cases. <clears throat> and uh, since I retired, I have written several things. One of them is an account of all this, uh, what we call the blacks and white colleges. It describes all of our court appearances and uh, what happened, demonstrations, and that sort of thing. It's difficult, of course, to. Uh, now in terms of uh, the law which prohibited the attendance of black students when we take a look at our basketball team our football squad that would be recruitment about us. That was a long time ago. Right. What else would you consider an important landmark? Your pardon? What else would you consider a landmark as your term as president? Well, we, uh, one thing that happened uh, was the development of the football division here, which uh, may have been overdone a little bit, but uh, back in 1945, Huey Luster, coach of the football team, announced that he 
on them to retire from sports and was a looking for a coach. And uh, that fall in the meeting of the regents, uh, the regents somehow got to talking about other things, about the low morale of the Oklahoma citizenry uh, caused in part by the factors which led to Steinbeck's great book, Place of Wrath. Oklahomans were apologetic about living here, even. The regents were talking about this and wondering what the university might do to uh, stimulate a bit of state pride. And Lloyd Noble, a member of the board then, uh, whose sons, uh, whose children, the possible Noble Arena, Noble Center, and so <clears throat> leaned back and said, well, uh, one thing that could be done, the war is coming to an end, and uh, there will be a four-year crop of high school athletes and four years of eligibility, and if we could find <clears throat> and bring them to the university, we could have, we didn't use the expression, and play football, but that's what it meant. And, uh, and the question was, how do you find these athletes? Are and another region who was placed guard for a year back in the 20s said, Well, every division, the armed forces, has at least one football team, and uh, they have coaches. So they're looking for a coach. The war ends if we could replace uh, Blue Luster as a coach from the armed forces. This coach would know the names of the best athletes that have been involved in the war. <clears throat> and uh, to perhaps recruit them. So uh, I was instructed to uh, get in touch with our athletic director who was serving with the Navy and the recreation department of the Navy to get some, some suggestions of names of potential coaches. He gave me the names of uh, the name of uh, oh, I mentioned Bear Bryant for one a young fellow real young man at that time but the uh, one that he had in mind was Jim Tatum uh, I called Tatum and asked him if he would be interested in coming to talk about uh, coaching the job and he expressed an interest and asked if he could bring with him a potential assistant so there's a young man named Wilkinson, and Charles Wilkinson, Brother uh, Thomas in with a master's degree from Syracuse, master's degree in English. And the thought was extremely promising, and I could totally bring him along. And they, they came in January of 1946, curiously enough, the same week that the Test black students is brought in to try to enroll in test our segregation laws. That's busy week. But uh, Tatum and Wilkinson were hired, and of course, uh, you know, I think about all your football, you know, Tatum stayed only a year, but Wilkinson stayed and established uh, records of continuous wins. I wrote that, but there were problems associated with developing the great football team. I wrote a book called The President's Camp Front, which uh, uh, tells about our adventures of football. The gist of the uh, significance of the title is a uh, football team in trouble, and uh, Trump momentarily out of trouble, and uh, the president. Can't do that. He has to hang on to the ball and hope he doesn't come along. But there were many, many problems that uh, related to our program, which I discussed in this book, President's Camp Point. Now, uh, another development uh, which I consider significant during my uh, 
when he was um, involved with the problem of civil rights for employees of the university. Back in the beginning, it was possible to fire a president with 30 days' notice, and uh, half the faculty were with him. This happened in 1980, began in 1911, and uh, up until the mid century, there was no job security at all. And uh, with the American Association of University Professors, had been organized as working on this and and had developed a set of principles called the 1940 Principles of the AAUP. And during my uh, administration, uh, I managed to get the regents of the university to approve the principles of the AAUP for the University of Oklahoma. I was written that up in a book called Professors, presidents, and politicians. Then, of course, the uh, war had an enormous impact on Norman. It wasn't so the basis here, but an impact on higher education everywhere, of course. But the impact here was uh, marked because of the presence of the basis. I wrote a, uh, an account of the war years called the University of Oklahoma and World War II. Uh, very personal account, even first person, that uh, discusses the significance of the bases and our acquiring them after the war was over. Problems that developed result of them being here and uh, conflict with the local citizens when there was a proposal that one of both bases be retained here, which would expand it. the university just like the uh, and normal. And uh, quite a severe uh, struggle with the Mormons and but the day basis were finally just established that you know, we acquired uh, the entire Northwest and uh, much of the South. Where were they closed? Almost immediately after the war was over, although uh, the South base was reactivated during the Korean War. We had not gotten part of that. We did not have were there many demonstrations about the Korean War on campus? Yeah. We had, uh, this campus has been remarkable for demonstrations. Mm -hmm. There were demonstrations in uh, Oklahoma, though. Uh, there were some arrests uh, made in Oklahoma City of groups protesting the Korean War, and I said, uh, not on a chance. What about during Vietnam, while you were president? Were there demonstrations during that period? We had uh, no demonstrations uh, uh, during the Korean War. Uh, we were forewarned about confrontations with students by uh, the events at Berkeley when uh, Clark Kerr lost his job out there as president as a result of conflicts with the student body. And then there were confrontations and troubles at the University of Wisconsin and Colorado and uh, even at Kansas. I attempted to forestall these by having <clears throat> the various student organizations name each a representative to form a sort of student council, which would meet with me Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, and I would spend a couple of hours every Saturday morning finding out 
but the students are wrong lawyers and uh, they have I mean, much, much of the time they were right, although some of the things they thought were wrong could not easily be corrected. But uh, I would interpret to this group the university side and the difficulties, and they would go back to their organization and uh, report the university side of the question so uh, we have no violence. No, uh, oh, we have no confrontations. About the war, the uh, students who protested here, and they did once our uh, requirement that uh, juniors and seniors would need to occupy university housing. And we just had no recourse. We had agreed to selling bonds to build a house, and we had agreed to maintain an occupancy which would require the bonds. If they did not live up to that, they would be personally liable for this. Program. So we had an alternative to do that, and we do less of the union than we talked about the problem. And uh, that we demonstrated by our own experience with the students. The problem of the space. He retired in 1968. 68. And was it Holloman that replaced you, Dr. Holloman? Uh, Holloman, Holloman. I retired five years before mandatory retirement to go into the banking business and do the writing of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I'm still doing. I spent all of my mornings here in the bank. Well, any comments about your term as president, besides what you've told me already? I think uh, not, except that uh, during that period, uh, in my presidency, it was purely by coincidence, as a matter of being president at that time, the nature of the university shifted from uh, undergraduate to graduate. At the time I became president, we had conferred only 81 doctorates in all of history. The first had been conferred by President Gazelle back in 1929. In the 1944, the total was 81. At my uh, the last several years of the commencements over which I presided, we conferred more doctorates than that of any commencement. It was one commencement. So, uh, we grew uh, toward a graduate institution or a true university type, as well as a college which had been prior to the war. But that uh, was not anything. I did this was just something that happened to the university. Time was right for this great development. Was Benny Owen still at the university when you first came here? Benny Owen was uh, elected into the Royal Athletics. He built a golf course in that area where the duck pond is. I made a nine hole golf course. Believe it or not, it made money. I mean, Benny was an amazing fellow up here. He was a, a uh, very innovative chap. He built this course, charged it at an auto green fee, but the sense made money. He was never usually a red, but he was in the black pleasant golf course. He was a red old man. What was Mr. Owen like? He was a, uh, you might uh, characterize him as a jolly fellow to me. A happy fellow, lost an arm, hunting accident was the main one. And uh, but he uh, exuded good humor, perpetually 
happy, uh, energetic, extremely energetic, buzzing around, always into something very uh, enjoyable to sit down. Sit down and tell the world what you want to know. Did you ever know Dr. Boyd? I did not know Dr. Boyd. Uh, he did not. Uh, he had visited the campus shortly before uh, a baby was here when I was on the faculty. Came for a visit, but I did not uh, get to meet him. New Brooks, what's he like? Peppery. Uh, just uh, bang, bang, bang in his conversation and quick uh, to make decisions. Well, a small man. He was a great builder, but uh, he built a good bit of the campus. As you mentioned. See, he took that house, for instance, a uh, big white house where we lived. So he was, that house was built by Boyd in 1905 at uh, the entrance facing Boulevard, University Boulevard, and the other modest house. Lloyd was fired in 1907, and he didn't get rid of very long. He rented that house to uh, his sorority. He didn't pay exactly that much. Then when Brooks became president, uh, following Evans in uh, 1914, and, uh, he, uh, <coughs> he wanted a House of the university traded a tract of land to Boyd for the house. Brooks uh, changed the entrance to the south, that was where the Zion and Collins are around the entrance, and uh, the screened in porch where the other entrance had been, and they changed the internal interior of the house rather than up to the end. Actually changed the silhouette of the house. Had a chewer to feel it too. And he was a builder and a persuader. He got along with the legislature extremely well. And uh, there was a saying that he would find out how much money the legislature had to pay it and then get up there and get most of it. It's an exaggeration of course. That was the way Brooks was characterized. How come the university stopped using that as the president's residence? Dr. Holloman uh, wanted to get away from the campus. So, uh, first, uh, he was going to build a house down in the south of the state, as a matter of fact. But the uh, plans. And estimates to obtain uh, indicated a cost of a quarter of a million dollars, which in those days was a lot of money. So finally, they bought the house at, uh, at uh, Fort Carson Lakes now. Bought that from Earl Sneed, who had been dean of the law school. Mm -hmm. What is that house being used for now? It's a, uh, there's some offices there, but mainly it's an information center. The visitor to the campus goes there and gets, uh, finds out where to go to do what, what she came to the campus to do. I have a question. I'm not sure if this is true or not. When Frank Lloyd Wright visited the university, I've always heard the story that he called the library Cherokee Gothic architecture. I would think that's a reliable rumor you've heard. Yeah. I think that was right he coined the term Cherokee Gothic. When did that take place? You know? No, I don't, because it happened when I was uh, a member of the faculty. And I wouldn't have an opportunity to meet the 
students, grad students, so it's a lot. <coughs> but uh, it is a uh, kind of a, not a happy, it's a pretty building, but it's a, a rather unhappy modification of Gothic. The administration building is a good Gothic building. It's uh, pretty cool well, but it's the only really Gothic structure we have. All the rest of the modifications are up to the uh, size of the whole. Um, Is there any reason why the university didn't try to get a standard type of architecture like OSU has done? <clears throat> I don't know why. Uh, you see, when they built the administration building, following the fire of the building there, they built uh, in Gothic, but uh, my boy uh, was president when Carnegie in the library was built, and when the old science hall was built, and this why he didn't uh, stay with the, <coughs> well, of course, I guess he didn't know, uh, he had no way of knowing it. He had nothing to do with the uh, Gothic, because uh, that Gothic building was built after he had been fired. But uh, the first, the two oldest buildings on the campus, uh, and the old science hall, Actually, the President's House is the oldest building in Holmesville, but it wasn't on the original campus. It's the oldest building owned by the uh, university. The next two are. Uh, so we started with a uh, really very unattractive architecture for which Boyd would have to be responsible. Uh, the building of uh, a good Gothic building, someone else's idea, he's a no, of course. But uh, then when they started filling in the rest of the campus, they made very uh, hasteless adaptations. They used the red brick and turned it to stone, but they parted the Tom Boat Hall and, and they built the lobby, and that was it. Architecture of wonder and the chemistry building across the street. So it was all done in those early days, uh, really before they uh, settled. Uh, up at, we have Georgian architecture up at OSU, very attractive, uh, far superior to what we have, although not particularly adapted for this uh, type of environment. But the uh, harmony is, is great and the buildings are very useful. And it is too bad that we got off to such a bad start on the North Oak. So and after that, the architecture, we, every architect could argue that he should express his own uh, skills and uh, since there's no harmony anyway, and all we did was insist that there be red brick and white stone, mm -hmm. a, a great variety of shapes which the physical sciences building uh, Looks like Devil's Tower just holding the line and across the line of South Florida. Yeah. It's an atrocious scene here. I don't know what you think, but we, we sort of agree. Mm -hmm. so I, I think built, uh, there's nothing south of the books on Africa really except the biology building. But all I tried to do. Let's keep as much harmony as possible. We had to build as cheaply as possible. We couldn't get much on ornamentation. 
Why well, insisted that we stick to work with the stone here, like stone here, the whole tower hole and the towers and the towers were built in that time. As a matter of fact, I told folks we had to use a lot of good examples to make some nice knowledge that there was quite a building back there that was shut. Sir, I think we have a good interview. Sir? I think we have a good interview. Well, good. Hopefully that's something that's helpful. Yes, sir. Thank you.